had enough of, of it already. Let's, uh, let's have some more math. This is how I know I am among my people. Um, but for a lot of people uh, outside this room, the word math evokes unpleasant memories of graphing lines and solving for x and doing word problems. People really hate word problems. And in my experience, when people go on about how much they hate math, uh, what they're usually talking about is algebra. That was certainly my experience. Uh, I dropped out of high school in my junior year, and I cannot tell you how happy I was not to have to fight with my algebra teacher anymore. But fast forward 11 years, I went back to college to get a computer science degree. And while I was really excited going into this to learn more about programming, I was really not looking forward to all of the math. Because as far as I knew at that time, algebra was math. Turns out, algebra isn't math. Or rather, it isn't all of math. To use math to make my point about math, algebra is a proper subset of math. Portion of this graph that resembles the Death Star, 100%. <laughs> <laughs> Math has all this other cool stuff in it, like Fibonacci spirals and fractals and hexaflexagons and graph theory. Discovering graph theory was the point where I started to think that maybe math could actually be fun. Uh, it was also one of those things along the way that led me to realize that math is a language. And algebra is just the grammar part of that language. This is not to belittle algebra. If you don't know the grammar of a language, there's almost nothing that you can say in it. But once you've mastered grammar, you probably don't give it much more thought after that. Believe it or not, that actually brings me to the title of my talk, Fluent Refactory. I'm a big fan of the Ruby Rogues podcast, so I'm going to channel Josh Susser and define my terms. <laughs> Starting with refactoring. Uh, here's a gr uh, definition I grabbed from refactoring.com. A disciplined technique for restructuring an existing body of code altering its internal structure without changing its external behavior. I have no doubt that every word here was carefully chosen, but there are a lot of them. Here are the ones that I think are the most important. If we drop the rest of them, we get a technique for restructuring code without changing behavior. And I think this conveys the same information as the previous one with fewer distracting details. And to me, that really is the essence of refactoring. It's about making your code tell a clearer story with fewer distracting details. Speaking of distracting details, one thing that I've noticed about refactoring is that it has a lot of jargon. Between experienced practitioners, uh, jargon is used to express complex ideas very concisely. But to a newcomer, jargon can be very intimidating. And just as there are people who have math anxiety, uh, it's been my experience that there are also developers who have refactoring anxiety. In an attempt to make refactoring a bit more accessible and approachable in spite of all of this jargon, uh, I would like to propose an alternate definition of refactoring, which is a language that describes ways to make your code suck less. Not, not suck, just suck less. Um, because if we think about refactoring as a language, then it becomes natural to talk about how people learn that language. Speaking of which, I owe you a second definition for fluency. Fluency can be thought of as what you can say when you're not thinking about how to say it, or what you can say when you're woken up in the middle of the night with a flashlight in your face. Really, both of these are talking about how you behave when you're under stress. I don't know about you, but stress makes me stupid. When I'm stressed out, I am really unlikely to try anything new. Uh, trying something new requires a level of focus that I just don't have because I'm too busy freaking out, which means that under stress, I only have access to skills I've already mastered. Hold on to that thought for a minute. Uh, we're going to come back to it. I borrowed this interesting definition of fluency from an organization actually here in Portland called Language Hunters. Um, I'm going to borrow one more idea from them, which is uh, a simple framework for describing levels of proficiency. Level one, they call Tarzan at a party. Words, simple phrases. Level two, going to the party. You know more words, but there are still things you find hard to say. Level three, discussing the party. Now you start to have some more interesting conversations. 
and level four they call Charlie Rose. This probably makes more sense. I didn't realize that was funny, awesome. Um, this probably makes more sense if you know who Charlie Rose is. Um, I had to look, up, look him up on Wikipedia where I learned that uh, he's a journalist, he has a talk show on PBS, and he recently interviewed the president of Syria. I especially like this model when you combine it with that definition of fluency as what you can say without having to think about how to say it. If you're fluent at level one, you can probably operate at level two some of the time, but you have to work at it. So maybe earlier in the day, I got out my transit map and a notepad and I asked somebody to help me figure out how to get to the party. But after I've been there for a while and I'm ready for some introvert time, uh, if you try to come up to talk to me as I'm leaving, you're gonna get fire bad tree pretty. Okay, enough definitions. I'm gonna tell you a story about some code that I encountered in the wild. Uh, now I'm gonna go fairly fast, so if you don't catch everything, it's okay. Um, I'm gonna put, uh, the code's actually already up on GitHub. Uh, there's obviously gonna be video, and I will publish my slides later today. We're gonna look at some code from a production Rails app. I got permission from its owner to use it in public, as long as I change the details. So we'll just say that this is from a cable company, and it's used to schedule installations for new customers. I also want to emphasize that I have a lot of respect for the developers who wrote the original code. It's very easy uh, as developers to sit down and look at some code we didn't write, throw up our hands and say, this is crap, I can't work with this. Personally though, I find it much more useful and interesting to ask, what does this code have to teach me? I realize that makes me sound like a saint, and believe me, I'm not. Um, it's really hard for me to get to that place of compassion, uh, especially when I stumble unprepared onto code like this. I'm deliberately using a tiny font here to emphasize the shape of the code. Uh, but even from 10,000 feet, we can make some very basic observations. There are, just to start with, about 800 lines in this file. Uh, about 50 of them are right here in this method. The longest line is 177 characters long. The indentation ranges from four to 16 spaces. And that indentation comes from nesting various control structures. Uh, we have this audit trail for a method that takes a block. Uh, there's a couple of begin, rescue, end thingies. And there's a whole lot of if statements. Head exploding yet? <laughs> um, I have a theory that once code reaches a certain level of complexity, it tends to get worse and worse over time. If it's hard to understand everything that the code is doing, uh, a developer who's working under pressure is going to make the smallest change that doesn't obviously break anything, um, run the tests, you know, if there are tests, and if they don't take too long. Uh, they're gonna breathe a sigh of relief and ship it. Unfortunately, uh, each of those individual episodes is going to leave the code that much more difficult to understand, and over time, you wind up with a controller that has 800 lines of code. I've been working in Rails for seven years, and in that time, I've seen a lot of controllers turn into junk drawers, but at 800 lines, this thing isn't just a junk drawer. This is an entire cabinet full of rusty cheese graters and broken dreams. And <laughs> my, my first instinct on seeing something like this is to clean all the things. But 800 li lines of code, especially Ruby code, is a lot of things. And so I have to manage my energy. I may not have the time or the brain power to deal with the whole mess at once, but what I can do is make the job smaller. So for right now, for this session, I'm just gonna focus on cleaning up this one method, these 50 lines of code. The other 750, they'll be there another day. Now, for the part that I am gonna fix, I already know from experience that this refactoring session is gonna take a while, so I'm gonna walk over to the cabinet, I'm gonna pull that drawer all the way out, and I'm gonna set it down right in the middle of the floor. Um, now, the formal name for this process is replace method with method object. There's a, a really great description of this in therapeutic refactoring. Um, those of you who were here last year know this already. Uh, so I'm just gonna do a real quick overview. Here's the Rails controller action uh, with the method body in question folded up. First thing I do is create a new object named after what that method is doing. This new object has one method, which I usually name call. Uh, I take the entire body of the original method and move it out into the call method. Then back in the original method, which is now empty, I create that object and I send it the call message. 
So I run the tests, and every single one of them raises a no method error because the code I just moved out of the controller sends a, sends a bunch, bunch of messages to self, things like params, render, redirect to. So in order to get this code to have any chance of passing, I have to pass in a controller. And now I have a few choices about how I'm gonna take those messages that used to be sent to self and make sure that they get back to the controller so it can do its job. I could go through the transplanted method and insert at controller dot everywhere I get one of these no method errors. Um, that sounds a lot like work. Um, also, I'm still looking at a red bar and my anxiety level about having failing tests is rising by the second. Um, for slightly less effort, I could extend forwardable and explicitly list all of the messages that I'm going to delegate back to the controller. Um, that still sounds like work. So I'm actually just gonna take door number three and use method missing. This is a hack. But it's also the fastest way to get the, t the tests to pass, so I'm gonna take it. I'll come back to this later at the end of the session, but for now, I wanna start digging into the method body proper. The first thing I see when I open up this method is a branch on request XHR. I don't know what XHR means, so I have to go look in the docs, and uh, I learn that it's an alias for XML HTTP request. So I guess I must be looking at different response handling for AJAX requests versus HTML ones. Okay, so I unfold the next layer of code, and I see a begin rescue end, cool, and fold that. And if the installation is pending a credit check, we render some JSON and return. Hey, I know what this is. This is a guard clause. I wonder if there's one of these on the else branch too, so I unfold that, and I expect to see a, a parallel begin rescue end, but instead I see this other thing that also looks like a guard clause. Uh, oh, I see, so the begin is actually after that. Okay, focus. <laughs> the important thing is that this code also sets a flash, me flash message, redirects, and then continues. So maybe this isn't a guard clause. Who writes this crap? At this point, I've completely lost my train of thought, and after a minute or two of swearing and, and using git blame and anger, uh, something catches my eye. 177 characters long. I'm just gonna take out that and and put the return on a new line. Uh, next up, I wanna focus on the funky indentation, uh, which is because one of these is inside a begin rescue and the other is not. I look at this for a minute, and I decide that I can just move the first guard clause up outside the begin rescue end. Now, technically, this could mean that I'm gonna raise some new exceptions that aren't gonna be caught, but this thing's just a call to render. I mean, what are the odds that somebody screwed up a call to render, really? So I run the tests, and they're fine. <laughs> and now that I've identified a chunk of code that does something, I wanna get it up out of the way so that it doesn't keep distracting me. I'm actually gonna make a copy of that entire branch on request XHR, and then I move each of the guard clauses up into that branch so that I can fold the whole thing up and, and not think about it anymore. Now this passes all the tests, but I'm not quite ready to move on. There's some obvious duplication in here, uh, but there's also something more subtle happening. I want this code to tell me a story. I've extracted a very small preface, uh, but it still doesn't sound quite right. This chunk of code does one thing. If a precondition is not met, it complains to the user and dies. That's what it does, but that's not what it says. The first thing that it says on the very first line has to do with XML HTTP requests. And the effect that this has on me as a reader is, it looks like you're working with Ajax. Would you like some help with that? <laughs> no. <laughs> Um, fortunately, both the distracting details and the duplication have the same solution. Um, I'm basically just going to invert these two layers of if statements. Uh, to accomplish this, I'm gonna use a technique called flatten nested conditionals. Um, this one's not in the, the big book, it's in uh, Dr. Dobbs' article by Michael Feathers. And uh, so there are two conditions here. There's this request XHR and this installation pending credit check. And to make these slides a little bit easier to follow, um, again, I'm gonna replace those with two variables, Ajax and Nope. This gives us two variables, two chunks of code. Each of these chunks of code will only be executed with a particular combination of those two variables. Right now, those conditions are implicit in the structure of this code, but 
as long as we only execute each of those chunks of code under those same conditions, we're free to use any control structure we like. I'm gonna start with a very small change. Uh, I'm gonna take this if else statement and I'm gonna break it into an if followed by an if not. Which seems silly, but now I have two if statements and each of them has an if statement inside it. So I can flatten those together. And that right there was flattened nested conditionals. Simple, you don't think of it right away. Um, and this is, turns out to be a really great tool for taking these deeply entangled structures, breaking them apart so that you can deal with each piece in isolation from the rest. Um, in this case, what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna put them back together in a slightly different way. I have these two if statements and nope is common to both of them. So I can actually pull that up to another if statement that surrounds both of those. And now I can take that if and if not and combine it back into an if else. So at this point I've done flatten nested conditionals followed by nest flattened conditionals to get rid of one bit of duplication which was that nope variable. As for the other one, that return is now the last statement on both branches so I can move it down after the conditional. Here's what I started with. Here's where I wound up. These two snippets of code do exactly the same thing. Uh, but in the new version, the reason for the guard clause, the fact that the installation is pending a credit check and we can't continue, is right up there at the top, and the response handling is secondary. Uh, and in fact, it's so secondary that I don't want to look at it here anymore. Now that I've taken that return statement and moved it out of the way, I can take this whole chunk of code, do an extract method, and give it a name. And now I'm down to a guard clause which which is four lines long, and in my experience, that's about right for Ruby. Uh, so I'm just about ready to move on to the rest of the method. I do want to point out before I do that, that I did make two copies of that request XHR call. Uh, there's the one that I started with, uh, which was below the, the guard clause that I extracted, and there's the one that I just pushed out into that can't schedule while, blah, blah, blah. At this point, I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do about that duplication, so I'm just going to go with it. Leave it, leave it there. Um, and I swear I put this slide in before I saw Carrie's talk. <laughs> um, as I kept working with this code, I used the same tactic again and again, which is to take that annoying call to request X XHR and push it down just one level of indentation. And as soon as I got it down by itself to where I could fold it up, I would take that thing and I would extract it out into a new, new private method. I'm gonna skip the play-by-play -play and just show you the before after uh, on the original method. Here's the before, here's the after. The code on the left is about 50 lines, the code on the right is about 20 lines. This is still more complex than I'm really happy with, but I can just about hold all of the details in my head as I read through it, so that's an improvement. The thing I like most about this method, though, is what isn't there. Uh, that request X XHR is nowhere in sight. Of course, the way that I got it out of this method was to extract it into a bunch of other methods, so let's go see where it went. <laughs> As I worked with this code, I wound up extracting five private methods that all have the same basic structure. Uh, let's look at one of the short ones. If this is an AJAX request, render some JSON. Otherwise, set a flash message and redirect. This code is using words like request, render, JSON, flash, and redirect. And all of those words are in the domain of a web controller, but they're sitting in here in an object that primarily talks about things in terms of the business process. This seems like a good time to mention a thing called the single responsibility principle. And here's a good way to detect when you have uh, possibly strayed from it. Uh, we've been working in a class that was named Schedule Installation, but if we were gonna name it according to the responsibilities that it currently has, it might look something a little bit more like this. Every and in this name is an additional responsibility that we've tacked onto this thing. And of the three responsibilities that we have here, the biggest contrast is between scheduling and installation and all that request business. So I'm gonna move all that request business out into a different object. Uh, there are a lot of things that I could name that new object, but because it seems primarily concerned with managing an HTTP response, I'm just gonna call it responder. Uh, quick recap. In the beginning, there was the installations controller. Uh, then 
<clears throat> I extracted a method object called schedule installation. Schedule installation still had all this code that thought it was in, in a controller, so I had to pass those things back using method missing. And now I'm gonna introduce a responder object into this chain. The responder's job is to bridge that gap between the domain of the web and the domain of the model. Schedule installation is gonna do its thing, and when something interesting happens, its job is just to tell the responder, hey, something interesting happened, go figure it out. It's up to the responder to figure out how to present that information in the context of the current web response, either by rendering some JSON or by sending a flash and redirecting. And uh, for right now, this responder is gonna use that same method missing hack to forward messages in itself back to the controller. And the reason it's gonna do that is I'm just going to take these methods and cut and paste them uh, from private methods in schedule installation, and I'm gonna move them into public methods on the responder class. And at this point, schedule installation is basically just one method. I can take it back and inline it if I care to. Uh, and now at this point, the responder is the biggest chunk of code. So I go and take another look at that. All of the methods that I just moved out into the responder have this form. There are five methods on this class, and that means that there are five copies of this branch on request XHR. This responder has an identity crisis. It's constantly asking if it should do this thing or that thing. Uh, fortunately, there's a refactoring for that too. It's called replace conditional with polymorphism. What we do is we take one object that knows how to solve two problems, but repeatedly asks which problem it wants me to solve, and I split it into two objects. Each of them solves one problem, and then I only have to decide once which tool I'm gonna use. The implementation that I went with for this is pure brute force. Copy paste the entire responder class, change the names. One's an AJAX responder, one's an HTML responder. By the way, that means that I now have 10 copies of that request XHR in my code. So, I'm gonna go add another one. <laughs> yes, this refactoring session goes to 11. But, and this is the really cool part, I use that call to decide which responder to create, and that means that I can go back through the two responder classes and delete all of the HTML stuff from the AJAX responder and vice versa. And in that process, I delete all 10 of those request XHR calls that were in this code. They're gone. And I, I think that that, uh, that one little bit of code, that request XHR, it tells a really interesting story about the flow of this process. It started out here in the controller. I moved it out with everything else. And I kept making more and more copies of it as I started moving things around. And finally, it's come full circle back into the controller where arguably it belongs. There's a lot more to this code, but that's all I've got time for right now. Uh, before I go, uh, I wanna give you some things that you can do to level up your refactoring fluency. And again, I swear I wrote this slide before I saw yesterday morning, but where do we go from here? Um, if you haven't read Hooter by Sandy Metz, start with that. Uh, this book is all about finding different ways to structure your code. Uh, it's gonna help you notice hidden responsibilities and give you plenty of ideas for structures that you can refactor toward. And if for some reason you can't afford a copy of this book, talk to me in person today. I will buy it for you, it is that good. And I, I do mean that, by the way. Um, at some point, you should probably also have a look at Martin Fowler's book. Um, there's also a Ruby translation of it. Um, I haven't read this one. And there's a catalog at refactoring.com. Whichever one of these you use, Keep in mind that these are references. They're not meant to be read through in a single sitting. Browse through the listings, find something you like, and go practice that. I also have a few suggestions for things that you can do that, while they themselves are not refactorings, they're things that are gonna make it much easier for you to experiment and try a lot of different techniques. Commit code every single, I see there's a question in the back, I will take them afterward. Oh, sorry, um, no worries. Um, where was I? Oh, right, so committing code every single time your tests pass, even if you only change one line. Um, if it's only been 30 seconds since the last time I committed and I'm already confused, um, it's much easier for me to just do a git hard reset 
and throw the code away. Um, it's much easier to do that often than to walk through the undo states of several different buffers and try to figure out exactly where everything was the last time the tests were passing. Just go back to a known good and you're done. Git commits are cheap, and Git history can be rewritten later. Neither of those statements is true about your time. Use the tools. For bigger messes like the, the code that I, uh, I worked with to come up with this talk, don't merge the first thing you try. Uh, check out a branch, work on it for a while, throw the branch away. <laughs> Go back to the beginning and check out a different branch. And try this time try attacking a different aspect of the problem first. If there was something that bothered you midway through, start with that. If you do find yourself in this process going through and doing the same thing twice, stop and think about whether you're doing that just because you're just reusing a step from earlier because it's easy to do, or whether that means you're starting to home in on the true shape of the problem. One of the best things you can do uh, to help yourself refactor is to speed up your tests. Uh, especially if you find yourself spending more than a couple of hours on the same code, it's really worth going through and writing some really fast tests and uh, making sure you have really good coverage on them. Tests are feedback. Uh, ideally, you should be able to get that feedback in less time than it takes you to think about whether or not you should run the tests. Half a second is about right. Um, one last time, go watch Therapeutic Refactoring. It's a great talk. Uh, Katrina covers a, a good technique for writing fast characterization tests that's well worth it. And at this point, there are just a few slides between you and lunch. There's the obligatory we're hiring slide. Um, these are some people who shared their ideas and their time with me. Thank you, Kirsten. Um, there's a link to the code if you would like to go and play with a big, ugly mess yourself. And there's my contact info. Um, if you have any questions, please come find me. Uh, don't let the hat and sunglasses put you off. My eyes are fairly light sensitive, and these just help me not get as many headaches. Um, really, though, if you can't tell by now, I love talking about this stuff, so please come and talk to me. With that, thank you.